Hi, this is Shannon from Reptile Way and welcome back to our channel for another build video. And today's build is gonna be designing the interior for a green tree python. But without me trying to explain it, I'm just gonna show you what the finished product looks like, just so you can decide whether this build video is for you. Hopefully that bit of footage as to what the end product looks like has given you a bit of an idea whether this build video is for you. Now you don't have to keep the design exactly the same. You can change it up, but at least we'll go through how you can go about making it and then it'll allow you to have flexibility with what you're gonna do with your build. The best place to start is obviously going to Bunnings to get your supplies. And if you've got a cute, cute companion like Cricket, which is my parents' dog, but um, it was around Christmas time, so this is why she's got the Christmas get up. So she came along with me to top up on my building supplies, which she absolutely loved. And yeah, let's get this build started. So we've got this beautiful enclosure built by Tanks by Congo, and I don't have the skills to build an enclosure this good or the machinery, um, so that's why I'm happy to pay the money for it. And yeah, beautiful enclosure. So now we're gonna be designing the interior of this enclosure, and you wanna start off by sealing up every little seam, gap, hole, crack, crevice you can find, because spray foam is really good at getting through the tiniest cracks. And if it does, it will get through that crack, that seam, and then it'll start to expand on the outside of your enclosure, damaging it. It's a pain to get off. You might need to sand it to get off and could cause a lot of damage on the outside. So this is what it looks like. And I haven't made it look pretty because spray foam is going to cover this. So if you've never done siliconing before, this is a good time to have a practice. And you can see I've put it over the top of screws as well. The only gaps are those holes where the cords are going to go through um, of my build. But yeah, that is where we're starting from with the inside. And before you do that, make sure the whole inside is nice and clean. Now we are getting some of that packing foam, polystyrene, whatever you want to call it, the white stuff that you find in TV boxes that they use to pack refrigerated stuff. Like if you order, I guess, refrigerated meals that come in an order, or you can find these at supermarkets, um, your local fish, fruit, veg markets will have things in these boxes. But I actually found a lot of these sheets at my local tip. I went there to, I was helping my sister clean out her house. I found a whole bunch of these and it was like I struck building gold. Um, so yeah, and you can also get some sheets like this from Bunnings, but they've got almost like a foil on them. It's in the insulation section where you got the stairs um, at Bunnings. So you can find sheets like that that you just peel the foil off but yeah what I'm using is I'm sticking these in place because these are going to act as channels for the spray foam in areas that I want to build the spray foam up this is going to allow me to do that otherwise you're going to use a ridiculous amount of spray foam because the spray foam will just sort of expand outwards and doesn't necessarily build up in certain areas unless you're putting them into channels like this so I find it just Let's you use your spray foam, um, I guess, more directed in certain areas so you're not going to waste it and carve big chunks off um, and just throw them away. 
So yeah, that's why I went down this sort of route. However, I had a different design in mind when I started the spray foaming. Once it expanded, once I started carving, I sort of changed my design a little bit. And I do like how the spray foam looks and if I've been thinking about it for a bit and I've had a better idea, I just sort of go with it. So my design, my idea from before the spray foaming is done and before I've started carving, it changes to when I've started carving and I, I think something else could work better or look nicer or be better for this particular species. And I've got my little shadow following me constantly. So I was actually doing this build in Bendigo whilst I was waiting for my apartment to be ready. And then I finished this build off um, up in my new apartment. So really, really good. But now we've done the back wall of spray foaming. We're flipping it over to do the side walls and make sure once you've done one of the side walls, you wait for that to set, then you can flip it over to do the other side wall. And also with the spray foaming, it doesn't really matter what brand you use, I guess. Um, there are a lot more cheaper options. I think the cheapest one was in like a blue can. It's given me a bit of a headache from Bunnings. So there's certain brands that I will go with just for ease and it uses up all the spray foam in the can. But now we've started the carving process and I didn't film all of this because it literally took me two days, I think, to do. And that would have made this video hours long. But I've started carving it and it's based off pretty much ancient buildings, ancient cities, tombs carved into cliff rock faces. And they're actually real life structures. Um, so that was my inspiration. You might recognize a few of them as well. Um, but pictures for inspiration are really, really great to have. And you can see for this entire build, I've just used an old kitchen knife to carve out everything. And it's a longer, thinner kitchen knife, allowing me to get into certain areas. And I'm just peeling stuff off with my hands as well. But it's starting to take form. The carving is pretty much there. I can start to see what this piece is going to look like. And we've got the cave here. And this cave goes quite far back. It goes pretty much underneath that water hole on top. Um, so making use of the space, increasing the surface area as well. And you can see, and this little pond waterhole looks so small in the video. It's actually quite a large waterhole for this enclosure. It just looks small because the positioning of it. And we've got another waterhole that I'm about to point to a smaller one because I like waterholes to be close to where the end of the perches are so that my snake isn't just drinking from the ground. There's water holes on each side of the walls and on the floor. And as well, it's going to almost, that surface area of water could add up with the water bowl on the floor, add up to, you know, two thirds of the enclosure bottom being water. So I like to think of it that way as well. But now we're starting with the grouting process, Devco sanitized grout, starting with light gray. So we're really sticking to light gray and black, nice and simple. You can mix the two grout colors to create darker grays and variations of grays as well to make this piece look more realistic. But how I start my grouting is I start off with a thicker layer to begin with so a thick pancake consistency of grout and you can even go thicker than this this was a little bit thinner than what I normally go for but just to make sure it's going to cover in all those air holes and then after this layer is dried you will see a few cracks that's okay because the second third fourth layer is progressively going to get thinner and then that'll fill in the cracks you'll get less cracks until you get no cracks and I found that works really really good with this whole process so it gives you a nice strong structure with that first layer it fills in all the air holes and it's pretty much going to be watertight by the time you're done with it after you've had the waterproofing as well so this is the method that works for me I know some people start with a thinner 
grout consistency then they go thicker 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 for me personally with spray foam without having lots of holes thicker first thinner 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 works for me better so it might be a bit of a preference play around with it if you want for me after all the builds that I've done over the past I don't even know how many years eight years I found this works quite nicely for me but if you do have other strategies share it in the comments with everyone and um, things you've learned hiccups you've had and a big thing that I've seen a lot of new builders do is not carving off the entire shiny top layer of that spray foam you need to carve the shiny top layer of spray foam off before you grout because otherwise the grout won't adhere to it properly and it causes it to flake off almost immediately or later down the track. Um, so definitely do that. And then also with this having air holes in and you're filling those air holes in with the grout, it's almost like the grout's getting its claws into the foam, into the piece making it that much stronger. That's why I've got builds that I did for my bearded dragon that made it from Darwin all the way down South Australia into Victoria without it cracking at all. But now you'll see me using smaller paint brushes so we can keep that detailing because I don't want to fill those details in. I want to keep it. So I'm going to use different size paint brushes so I can accentuate those details but also make sure there's no exposed spray foam. And you can see there's also like holes in this piece too that obviously we're going to have no exposed spray foam, we're grouting it, but that's where the branches can sort of get pushed into. But this is a majority of the grouting finished. I think this is the third or fourth layer, fourth layer I think that was. Now we're on to the fifth layer, but it's not a complete layer. This is just for detailing. So we're going in with a black sanitized Devco grout and I'm just darkening areas where I think it'd be naturally dark. So cracks, caves, we're going to add depth to this piece. Now, when you look at this stage finished, you're going to be like, this does not look good. It does not look nice or natural. Remember, you're going to have spray paint phase that's going to go over this and dry brushing. It's just really going to make those cracks seem deeper. Those caves seem to go further back. Um, it's really going to accentuate certain details that you couldn't really do just through the uh, spray paint or the dry brushing. Um, so I quite like doing this. However, keeping in mind this build, I had to do a bit quick. So I couldn't put as much detailing in. So if you've got all the time in the world, your snake's not going to be moving in here till for six, nine months, take your time, have some fun with it, enjoy it, especially the carving stage. If you want to make it more realistic to those ruining picture inspirations I showed you earlier, do it. Um, but anyway, we're just carving in some cracks, crevices, the bricks on these old ruins. So you, when you want to carve with a knife, you want to wait for the grout to be almost dry, but it's a bit damp to the touch. And that is the perfect time for carving. Now, I didn't do a lot of carving on this because, again, time issues. But as well, there was still a lot of detail from the spray foaming and how I did the grout using the different paintbrush sizes to keep the detailing to make it a bit less work later on. And now we're getting on to the spray painting. So pretty much this is just a cheap spray bottle from Bunnings um, with some water and then some black acrylic paint. And it's just the cheap acrylic paint from Bunnings that you can get for about $2 or something like that. And you almost can use a whole tube, half a tube to a whole tube can go in this water bottle, um, spray bottle, and then you shake it up, spray it on another surface before you start spraying it in your enclosure, just so it's coming out properly and you can give it a test. But again, I'm focusing on those dark areas and you can see me focusing on darkening the areas towards the top of the rock formations where that roof is as well, the enclosure top. I want the rock piece to blend into the roof of the enclosure so you can't just see, oh, there's the top of the enclosure and then it goes straight to rock piece. I want it to sort of blend in and fade in and out of one another. A 
And also after I've done the spray painting and the dry brushing technique, we're going near a water hole here. After I've done this just before I waterproof, I actually re-grout my water holes just so there's nothing on the in the water holes besides just that freshly layered two layers of grout or something like that. There's no cracks. There's no little bits of grout that have crumbled off. It's just perfect and smooth. So that's something to keep in mind. Do this amazing detailing. Once you're done just before the waterproofing, I do recommend re-grouting your water holes. And you can do it to sort of match the color that um, of the area around it. So that's personally what I do. It keeps your water holes lasting for longer and easier for cleaning because you want the water holes to be a smooth surface um, for when you're wiping it, cleaning it, that type of thing. But here we've done the black spray painting and you can start to see it's starting to come a little bit more to life. You can see some depth. There are parts of it that look like it goes further back. But also after each stage, the grouting, spray painting phase, wipe up your enclosure and clean as you go um, because even though it's acrylic paint and water, for some reason that can be really hard to get off once it's dried and same with the grout, so wipe it up as you go. When it's still wet, it's a lot easier, a lot quicker. It'll save you a bit of time. So this is the type of cheap acrylic paint you can get from Bunnings. It comes in all colors. So this is the brown one I'm using. And again, half a tube to a tube in that bottle. And then with some water, fill the water to the top, shake it up, spray it on another surface again to test it, to make sure it's coming out and then spray it in certain areas. Now, again, when I was spraying this, I was like, oh no, I have stuffed it. <laughs> this looks terrible. I don't like it, but it's easier to get locked into just black and gray. But again, once you get to the dry brush brushing phase, this all starts to come together and be a bit more cohesive. So it's a bit blocky right now, um, which was why I was worried. But you sort of have to have a vision to the end. And yeah, I wanted it to bring a warmer touch because I wanted this to almost look like a rainforest. Um, so that's why I wanted to make sure there was some warm browns in it. Um, so it matched that theme. And again, it wasn't just going to be slaty gray rock formations. Um, there's a bit more color in it. But anyway, we're going to the dry brushing technique. This is the white paint from Bunnings again. And we have to make sure that spray paint is dry, your whole piece is dry before you do the dry brushing. And then you get some of the white paint on your brush and you can wipe some of it off if you get too much on. And then you're just gonna brush it over the formations just so bits of the white paint go onto the raised areas of your build. So this is gonna look like the wind, the rain has been ripping at this piece for thousands of years. It's looking worn. It is really looking like crumbly ruins, like bits are going to crumble off any second. And as well, it ties it all in together. You can start to see the browns, the harsh browns, the really harsh blacks sort of fading in slightly. So it's looking a little bit more cohesive. And I didn't show you all the paint work because there's that black triangle um, chunk of black paint that I did add some more brown into as well so you've got to step back have a look leave it for a few hours have a think then come back to it um, so the painting can take a couple of days whilst you're trying to get it right but remember you're going to be putting plants in here branches some of these formations are going to be covered up and that'll break it up as well. So you don't need to be too set on making it completely perfect because ruins, rock formations, they're not so perfect and uniform. Um, and especially the rock part, you want things to be on an angle, whereas the, the ruins, you want there to be more straight lines and it looks like purposeful cuts in the rock. Whereas when you go to the natural rock formation, you have to disregard that altogether. Um, so it's nice having two different structures within one build, two different ways to go about it. But this is what it looks like now that all the painting process has been done. So, and that included the, the black grout detailing, the spray painting and the dry brushing. So all those techniques can create something that looks like this. 
And remember, once you start the waterproofing, and we're using this Cromlin clear pond sealer, it does dull this. So that other bit looked like it stood out a lot. The white bits might stand out. This dulls it a little bit, so keep that in mind. You might want things to look a little bit more poppy before you actually put the waterproofing on because it's going to dull it down a bit. So that's what I found and I tried to keep in mind for my builds and I tried to get some colors that pop a bit more. And now we're on to the lighting here. So this is the UVB light. You don't need a UVB light, but this is a low 2.4% um, UVB, which is perfect for these guys. But you did see I use these brackets and bolts to sort of rest the light on. And you'll see how this all comes into play later. But this was the light I used. I actually bought it from my local pet shop. You can order it online but it is less UVB than the forest ones. So the less UVB, the better for green tree pythons because they can get UVB burn. So the forest Arcadia one has 6%, this has 2.4%. So the bird one was worked quite well with this green tree python enclosure. But now what we're doing, we're creating our own protective cage for this light because the cages online just wouldn't work because I'm having this directed on an angle and it's going to be hidden uh, within the top lip of the enclosure. So what we're doing is we got that mesh that we showed you and again purchased from Bunnings. We're wrapping it around and I'm securing it with zip ties along. Now remember the part that you're securing it with zip ties and where the mesh sort of folds on together the animal is going to have no exposure to this because it's going to be shoved up the top of the enclosure. So it can't get to these parts. So again, you want to make sure when you make this, it is completely smooth so that the animal cannot snag its skin on. And bits that are a bit rougher, you either find maybe electrical tape or something that you can cover it with, um, or you pop it in an area where the animal can't access that particular area that might have some raised surfaces or something like that so we literally did a tube we wrapped it around the light and now these bits are for the ends of the light so we're cutting out circles for both ends and you will see there's an end with a cord we had to cut a little hole in the middle of this circle thread the cord through then plug the cord in and push the mesh circle in as well. But you'll see what we're doing here. So I've got my lovely granddad helping me. He actually flew from Bulgaria with my nan to come spend time with our family for a couple months. And he is amazing when it comes to figuring out problems. He built a whole house on his property. <laughs> so a granny flat type thing. So he's, he's very handy and good to brainstorm ideas with. But what we did is we shoved that circle bit of mesh into the end there and we're just folding now over the end bits of the um, mesh and folding it into the circle. So there's going to be no exposed jagged bits because it's folded into the structure itself. And after I did all this, we ran our hands along any bits that the snake could have in contact with. We did not get one scratch, but you do have to be diligent and careful you can't just rush this process it takes a while but this is how it's looking so we got those sort of brackets from Bunnings with the bolts in it and this is how it's going to work we can rest the light on there it can be tilted and I can attach this into the top lip of the enclosure and we only figured this out when we went to Bunnings and we're just like, let's just have a look down the aisles. What's something we can use, create that isn't necessarily meant for that, but it's going to allow us to do this. So you can see there, the light will be hidden. You can't see this light, but it's going to light up that rock area. And as well, because we've got a thermostat that will be attached to the heat lamp, the heat lamp won't be on all the time. So I still want this area to have light but I don't want to cause any damage to my snake with it being high UVB. So low UVB or no UVB, UVB at all, just a normal standard light um, will work as well because they don't necessarily need UVB. But now we're on to the heat lamp. So this heat lamp you can buy off Amazon, which is where I get mine. Um, you'll need a drill, a Phillips head drill bit, um, 
you need to pre-drill a hole in before. We've got some screws that we're going to be using as well. Um, we've got some Gorilla Tape uh, scissors. So it just shows you everything you're going to need for this process. And don't be too scared. I used to really hate drilling, screwing things in. It did used to terrify me until I gave it a go. And once you have a few attempts at it, you're pretty okay. So what we've done is we dismantled this whole light and it's so simple. You just unscrew everything, take one bit off at a time and remember how you took it all apart and just put it back together in the same way. So that's exactly what we did here. And yeah, it allows you to get that cord through the gap, um, the small gap that you've got. And yeah, you can ha attach these lights from the inside, but the cord can escape to the outside of the enclosure to be plugged into the wall. And I've had no problems with these heat lamp cages and lights themselves personally. They've always worked well for me. And for this enclosure, you're only going to need like a 40 to 50 watt heat bulb. Um, and definitely a thermostat because these wooden enclosures and especially with all the rock, the spray foam, it holds heat extremely well I found through my builds and especially through my bearded dragon build as well. The rocks, the grouting, spray foaming, it's really good at keeping the heat, the temperature that you want it. So definitely thermostat so you're not going to overheat your animal. Um, but we'll get more into that um, later on temperature testing. But I did use the Gorilla Tape to secure it in place and then I can easily pre-drill the holes and put the screws in. But this is what it's starting to look like with the heat lamp in. I do secure all of those wires towards the end. I did use Gorilla Tape, but I might actually get later down the track um, those cord runners that you can actually hide cords with. You can get them from Bunnings. I don't can't specifically remember the name but um yeah they're those plastic things that can hide cords you can get black white ones but now we're doing the sticks and I've got my my grandparents working hard we've got a bit of a sweatshop here and it was like a 30 degree day when we're doing this so what we're doing is we're carving all the bark off we're sanding all the sticks down and then they had a break my granddad was turning 80 when he was coming to visit so this is him like a week before his 80th birthday or a few weeks and he's riding motorbikes <laughs> my mum's off as well so we had um, a bit of a pause whilst everyone had their motorbike fun and now back to work so we're washing off these sticks and again sticks that you get from the elements you want to make sure there's no nasties that you're gonna bring into your enclosure so what I do is after I've done that whole process you saw I'm gonna put it, submerge the sticks in water with bleach, earth dishwashing liquid, and I'd leave it there for two to four days. And then I'll rinse all the suds off and then I will let it, leave it submerged in clear water as well. So then I'll dry it in the sun, leave the sticks out in the UVB sun to dry, and then they're ready to go, cut up, put in your enclosure. So now I'm actually siliconing this particular one in place because I don't want to drill through the bottom of the enclosure because then it could cause moisture to leak through the bottom so I'm just securing it with silicone which works quite nicely and yeah silicone it in place I did use quite a bit to give it a bit of strength support and now we're actually putting the sphagnum moss in and remember with the silicone you want to give it seven days to cure minimum and the same with the waterproofing so this was a good seven days later and now we're putting in the bedding so this is a really good type of bedding to use for reptiles even though it doesn't say for reptiles um it doesn't I guess mold easily under high humidity conditions I just use it on so many of my reptiles and you can mix it with different substrates as well. The coir bricks, um, the sphagnum moss, um, you can use it in bioactive mixes. It's really, really good. It's sort of like where people use the coconut husk products and things like that. This is sort of equivalent to that. Really, really good for holding humidity without molding. But now we're getting on to the fake plants. So you can get this from Spotlight This Plant and 
it spotlight has a really good variety of fake plants and what I did is I just cut bits off cut them down and I'm just getting some um, rocks and I'm siliconing it all in place putting some substrate over it when the silicone's wet and then it creates almost weights at the bottom of this plant so it can't easily be pushed over but you can remove it change the plants out change the location and before you put the plants in I'm dealing with the water situation so it's good to fill up your water holes first especially mine are located at the back just because I found my snake is a bit more comfortable where it's not drinking towards the front of the enclosure where it feels safer, but it does make it trickier for cleaning. So keep that in mind. You can bring your water holes closer to the front of the enclosure. Um, totally up to you. You'll see how the method I use for draining these. So you can use almost like these large pipettes that you can buy online. You can buy them in packs of things as well. And you can use this to suck up the water and then you can um, shoot it out into a container like this and then I get a cloth I completely dry the water hole give it a good wipe down and then fill it up with clean water so it's that easy so now we're putting the fake plants into places and again I'm going for creating like a jungly atmosphere you know a forest, rainforest. I really am trying to mimic the natural environment. This is the probe for the thermostat that I've just siliconed in place in a bit of a, a cracker groove in the in the back wall of this enclosure. And this is what we're going to be plugging our heat lamp into the thermostat. So this probe reads the temperature in the enclosure. If it exceeds what we want it to exceed, it'll take that information back to a thermostat. The thermostat will switch off the power to your heat lamp. So that's sort of how it works. And this thermostat has been really reliable for me. Bought it from my pet shop. A lot of people use this particular type in Australia. And this is how easy it is to set up. So I've got my setting at 31 degrees. It can exceed three degrees up, three degrees below before it'll switch the uh, heat lamp on or off. And yes, yeah, so there are the settings I had it on. When you're testing your thermostat, get temperatures of your enclosure till it's set to the right temperature you want it at. And for your purchase, squiggle sweep spot is 27 degrees to 29 degrees for each its perch temperatures but you want a variety but that's my granddad there he's holding squiggle he's trying to get better with snakes um he's doing really well i i think he's had some fun with my animals and um yeah learning a bit more about them and not being so scared of the snakes but here we go we're putting squiggle into his or hers new enclosure and Squiggle has brought along its support stick. It will not let this stick go. This is its favorite perch and I'm trying to gently put it in but Squiggle is getting a little bit uh, freaked out and then till it eventually plays dead <laughs> till I walk away. Um, yeah and then once I walk away Squiggle goes back to its normal self of exploring. Happy days. Um, yeah Squiggle is quite a friendly green tree python um, never really had an issue with Squiggle. Yeah, pretty cool snake. But now we've got Squiggle exploring the enclosure now, checking out the perches, which perch is going to be its favorite perch that I will always find it on. Um, so the first three days you might see it sleeping on different perches or hanging out on different perches until it finds its favorite. So this is Squiggle's favorite perch now. It seems to be at a perfect temperature and Squiggle's perch is at around about 20, the high 27s to 28.7 degrees. So that's Squiggle's sweet spot, whereas some green tree pythons might like it cooler, some might like it hotter, but having perches that range from 26 degrees all the way up to 32 degrees, I find is a really good thing to have. But a good way to tell if Squiggle is comfortable in its new enclosure, this is a week after, Squiggle is eating absolutely fine. So a good thing to know is if you don't get their humidity right, you might find them on the floor. If they're not really liking their enclosure, they're stressed, 
You will find them in odd places, not on perches, and they also may not eat. So you want to save a meal for around about, I'd say, five to seven days after you've moved them into their enclosure because by then they should have settled into their groove and then you can really see, okay, are they comfortable in this enclosure? And as well, we had a perfect shed. It came off all in one piece, which again is a good sign the humidity and temperatures are good. So these are all the observations you want to make after you've put your snake in that enclosure. And look, this just shows you the length of squiggle and it's a perfect length for this size enclosure. And once squiggle gets older, I will probably upgrade again, but squiggle is still somewhat younger um, and only turned green a few months ago, four or five months ago. And yeah, but what a beautiful enclosure. Thank you so much guys for watching this video. I really do hope it did give you a little bit of building inspiration along with the know-how of how to go about this yourself. And if you did like the video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up. Uh, if you've got any questions, queries, drop it in the comments and don't forget to hit subscribe. Again, it really helps build our channel, but we'll see you next time. Bye guys.